Okay, our next video moves us into the period of Buddhism in India. So we are returning to India. A few videos back we were looking at the Indus Valley civilization in Pakistan and into areas of India. Um, however, at this point the population is changing, the population is migrating, and we move into what's called the Vedic period. The Vedic period runs from about 1500 to 500 BCE. Um, this is when a number of texts are being produced and uh, there are some rituals of worshiping gods that are being formalized around this time. Um, these rituals were conducted by priests or individuals of the highest order so or highest caste uh, and so this is when the caste system is also being established and these books of prayers do survive. These four books called the Vedas were composed around 800 but known orally before this. Um, this caste system which is discuss discussed in much greater length in a number of other videos that you can find online. I just wanted to introduce the caste system very briefly. Uh, the caste system in India is, is very well known. Uh, it has been outlawed but continues to have a great effect throughout society in India today. Um, but there were these, it's quite complex, but a very basic introduction to the caste system would be the Brahmins, the priestly caste, the highest caste, then the warrior caste, then the farmers and merchants, the peasants, and then those who are outside of the caste system, the outcasts or the untouchables. And this was all established within the Vedic period. One of the goals uh, was to escape a cycle of rebirth, uh, this idea that you would be reborn and uh, depending on what you had done in your previous life, perhaps if you had earned good merit, you had developed, uh, you'd done good things, you would move up into a higher caste. You would become something better than you'd been in the life before. So this concept of samsara was very pervasive in India um, and will become important in both Buddhism and in Hinduism. And so this ultimate objective is to break out of this endless cycle of rebirth because life is painful and difficult. And if you think about life thousands of years ago, it would have been especially challenging, uh, especially if you were a member of one of those lower castes. Uh, so to reach point of extinction or inaction to escape this cycle of rebirth is known as nirvana for Buddhists and moksha for Hindus. So a very basic introduction to the Buddha Shakyamuni or the historical Buddha. Uh, he was born Siddhartha, Gaut Siddhartha Gautama in the 6th century near the border of India and Nepal. So there's always this debate of where exactly he was born. So I'll just say it was near the border. Um, he was born into a noble family of the warrior caste, so towards that higher level of the caste system. He used meditation to reach enlightenment and became known as the Buddha, the enlightened one. Some Someone who could enter nirvana, but he decided to remain on earth to teach others how to reach enlightenment. Uh, and this took a long time for him to realize the way to nirvana. So he tried different techniques of really restricting himself, not eating. There are images of the Buddha where his body is completely emaciated. So he was trying all these different ways to reach this this path to reach nirvana, to reach enlightenment, and uh, he has to try out a number of different ways to, to finally figure out the correct way. Uh, and his moment of enlightenment happens under a Bodhi tree. So I have just a Bodhi tree leaf uh, in the in the image here you can see the leaf here uh, and so you often do see Bodhi trees and leaves as one of the markers of the Buddha in Buddhist art so I wanted to include that there uh, he spent the next 40 years teaching his doctrine or his Dharma or law in northern India so he sets this Dharma in motion he starts spreading his his way of reaching enlightenment of reaching Nirvana so when we look at uh, Buddhist art, it is very important to think about how do we recognize the Buddha. And the first part of Buddhist art is what we call uh, an iconic. We don't see images of the Buddha. But I wanted to just introduce, once we get to that iconic period, how to recognize the Buddha. And we're looking at an example of a Buddha from the Gandhara period, uh, this larger Buddha here. So look for the halo, the usnisa or cranial bump, the third eye. These are markers of his uh, knowledge of his uh, place as a special being or special individual. He had these long pendulous earlobes, which were a marker that he did come from an upper class family and that he had left behind that life of luxury, that his ears had held very heavy jewelry. And so that was that marker of the, 
the earrings that had pulled, the heavy jewels that had pulled on his ears. He often holds a mudra or hand gesture. In this particular case, he holds his have no fear gesture. So I always like to point out in in certain cultures, this means stop, but when we see it in South Asian art, it means have no fear. So it's important to make that kind of shift in your assumption. He generally wears very simple garments, very simple clothes, a monk's robe. Um, so if you see a being that has a lot of jewelry on or very fancy garment, that is generally not going to be a Buddha. He is also generally barefoot, another marker of leading a very simple existence. Um, and here's just a close-up of a Buddha's face. So you can see again that cranial bump, the third eye, and those pendulous earlobes. So the main teachings of Buddhism are the Four Noble Truths. And so he comes to this realization that life is suffering. And the reason for this suffering is our desire. This is often translated in different ways. And again, there are a number of videos on Buddhism that talk about this. But I always like to ask my students, what are the things that you desire that um, cause you great suffering? And so they'll say things like a car or a new video game or, you know, some people want more time, more love, or again, money. Um, but these are things that, according to Buddhism, these are impermanent. These are not things that last. These are not, these are things that are going to cause you this suffering. So this idea is to free yourself from this desire and to follow what's called the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is just right view, resolve, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. And really the best way to follow the Eightfold Path is is to become a Buddhist monk. This is really the goal of these monks, to follow this Eightfold Path quite precisely. But of course, there are also a number of practicing Buddhas, Buddhists who are not monks um, who attempt to follow this Eightfold Path. So as I mentioned, when uh, Buddhism was first established and art started being produced in India, it was an iconic, meaning we do not see the Buddha represented. So in this particular example, we're seeing the lion capital from the Ashoka column. So Ashoka was the first ruler in Northern India to uh, become Buddhist, to start following Buddhism. And this is what we call the Maurent period. So a strong empire around this time known as the Maurent period. Uh, it dates to the third century BCE. This is, was on top of a column that marked the site of the Buddha's first sermon at Sarnath. Um, so with his first speech, the Buddha set the wheel of Dharma in motion, the wheel of this law. So you can see the wheel right here. You can also see four animals represented, a bull, a lion, a horse, and an elephant, and then uh, four lions on the top that go out into the cardinal directions. This idea of spreading Buddhism throughout the land um, the Buddha was also known as, or Shaka, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni was known as the lion of his clan. So this historical Buddha was known as having um, a prominent role in his family and also having a, lo a loud booming voice, like the roar of a lion. So um, that's an interesting connection to the animals here. The Maurin period was known for an art of high polish. So we see this stone, this polished sandstone that has been worked to create an amazing amount of texture. So the difference between um, the fur of the, of the lion, the legs, which are highly polished, and then the texture along the base here. And then um, you can see this element curving down along the column capital, the top of the column. You can see that it is a very large, column capital. So this is just to give you a sense of scale. You can also see that this was part of a system of edicts of the ruler Ashoka that he um, moved around or that he distributed around his territory as a way of spreading his ideas and spreading information about his rule. Uh, so Ashoka did decide to convert to Buddhism after uh, a long period of spreading his empire and going through a lot of warfare where thousands of people had died and had been injured. And so he comes to this realization about life and about living in a Buddhist way. Uh, this column capital is very important in India, so we see it actually in a lot of historical um, seals and the flag. You see the wheel incorporated into it. You can see an old postage stamp, so it's very, very well known. Um, this is the base of the lion capital pillar in its, in its original site in the Deer Park at Sarnath. So this is the location where the Buddha's first sermon took place. 
Another example of that wonderful Maorin polish is a figure we call the Chauri bearer or the Yakshi. So a Yakshi is a, a fertility figure. Um, so again, there's a debate about exactly who she is, but there's a kind of nice connection back to those fertility figures from the Indus Valley. We also see that wonderful Maorin polish again and that interest in texture. So we can see that her breasts, her stomach, uh, her face all have this high polish, this high level of finish, and then around her hips, around her ankles, around her wrists, we see bangles and jewelry. We can see how along her legs, there's this very thin fabric um, covering up her legs. And then you can see along the back, the same fabric here, very ornate hairstyle. The chauri is just the fly whisk that she's holding, so you can see that in her hand. Um, dates to around the same century as the lion column capital, uh, and the debate is, is she a fertility figure or is she more of a courtesan from the Maurin court? So we're not 100% sure, um, but those are two possibilities that have been suggested, but I wanted to show her to you as this example of um, Again, a wonderful example of this Maurin polish, this interest in texture, the wonderful sculpture that we see from this very early period, um, and also that idea of fertility continuing on into this later period. So one of the earliest Buddhist monuments is the stupa. And so to commemorate the Buddha's death, or what's known as his para-nirvana, where he's moving into this point of extinction, uh, is the stupa and so his remains were distributed amongst a group of stupas and then this number of stupas became much larger thousands of stupas were created um, as a way again to commemorate the buddha and as places of meditation for followers of buddhism so the way the uh, stupa works is you enter through a torana through one of the gates which are placed at the cardinal points so north, south, east, and west. And then you circumambulate the structure, and this is to encourage your meditative practice. This is a very significant stupa. There are actually smaller, there are actually smaller stupas around it, as well as vihāras, which are the monk cells and monk places for monks to live, Buddhist monks to live. Um, and it was enlarged over many periods. So it was enlarged and renovated over many periods. So it did become this very important site. The site overall has a very kind of celestial quality to it. You can see it almost looks like it's echoing the heavens. And if we get into some details, just to go back quickly, this is just an aerial view and then a view from the side to see the elevation. Um, if we see this other view, you can see the components of the stupa. So you have the chatra, the umbrellas at the mast. This crowns the entire stupa and refers to the three jewels of Buddhism, the Buddha, the law, and the community of monks. The torana are the gateways, which in this case are heavily adorned with sculpture. You have the railings or fence, which demarcates the secular space from more sacred space when you enter in to begin more of a meditative practice. Um, you circumambulate, so you move in circles, and then also there are stairs that lead to this upper level. There are relics located inside the dome, so this is this idea of commemorating the, the death of the Buddha or his transition to, to nirvana. Sometimes it can also be um, Buddhist texts, and so you have this idea that it could be a variety of objects, but early on it was remnants of the Buddha's body. And then there's a pillar that runs through the middle. Uh, in art history, we often call this the idea of the axis mundi, this idea of connecting the heavens and earth, the terrestrial and the celestial. And so the pillar runs through the length of the dome, symbolizing the universal cosmic pillar that divides the heaven and earth. We see another idea of fertility on this um, on this structure. So in on one of the torana, on one of the gates, this is the east torana, we see a very famous figure that's often called a yakshi. Um, she could also be called a bracketing figure because she's featured on the torana. Um, she's in this three bends pose, so her body is heavily kind of moving in different directions. It's emphasizing a dynamic pose. Uh, and so what we see here is a figure who clearly does have some links to fertility with the touch of her toe This tree seems to spring to life and bear fruit. She obviously looks very curvy similar to the chari bear We just saw so there's an emphasis on her breasts and her soft belly uh, In this case, however, we can see her genitalia and that's a reason people believe that if we go back to the chari bear That this figure might not be a yakshi because her bottom portion is still covered up She still does have obviously very large breasts and a soft belly, um, but in this case, this figure is much more revealed. Um, both women, however, are heavily adorned uh, with bracelets and all these bangles on their wrists and on their ankles, giving it a sense of sound and this idea that if the figure was moving, the jewelry would be um, kind of 
moving around and making wonderful sounds. Uh, it's fairly large, about 60 inches, and so people often say that this decoration refers back to older traditions of Indian art, um, that it doesn't necessarily link to Buddhist iconography, that it's more the traditions of Indian art that are then being carried into the decoration of Sanchi Stupa. We also see a number of jatakas that are represented on the Sanchi Stupa, including the monkey jataka, or the, also known as the great ape jataka. So there were over 500 stories of the Buddha's past life, this idea, past life. So the idea that the Buddha had to work through so many different challenges in order to make it to becoming the Buddha, the enlightened one, the, per, the individual who could make it to nirvana. And so the story goes that there was a monkey king, and this was the, this is the Buddha, um, and he's obviously a very good king and a very um, worthy king and his there's a, a mango tree that he and the monkeys that he leads uh, have access to and there's also an earthly king a human king who tries the mangoes and realizes that they're wonderful and wants to have full access to this uh, wants to have full access to this tree and so one day they catch the monkeys eating the mangoes and so the Buddha in the form of the monkey king helps all of his monkeys escape across the river and so they create this bridge so the monkeys can escape and to be safe so that this human king doesn't attack them. And so all the monkeys escape and the Buddha is risking his life to do this in the form of a monkey. Um, however, there's always a bad guy in these Jataka stories and so eventually this bad monkey breaks the back of, of the Buddha, of the monkey king. And uh, and of course, then the monkey the monkey dies. Uh, however, not before uh, he, the king realizes that the monkey was a great figure, and the, the monkey is the monkey king is then given a wonderful funeral. Um, you can see that there's kind of this connection between the two. But just the idea that these stories have a reoccurrence of the Buddha offering himself, giving himself, and um, really making this kind of ultimate sacrifice, willing to give his own body to help others. And we see this in other Jataka stories as well. We also see in an iconic form uh, the departure of the Buddha from his palace, leaving behind his very fancy life, uh, where he was part of this warrior caste, part of the, this noble family. So we can see the palace that he's leaving behind, and then we can see these umbrellas that mark his movement away from the palace life and eventually moving towards a more enlightened existence. And so you can just see his footprints here. So again, there's no... Uh, representation of the Buddha's body. We're in this aniconic phase, so it's more about the umbrella marking his presence, his footprints, uh, the, the horse is supposed to mark his presence. However, we're not seeing his body yet. The wheel, of course, too. There you can see the wheel and the columns as connecting back to the idea of the columns of Ashoka. All right, we're gonna move into that iconic period with the Kushan Empire. And so in the Kushan Empire, we have two capitals, um, the Gandhara, so you have the capital in Gandhara and then Mathura capital. And we see two different styles of the Buddha developing around this time. So I'm just showing you a map of the Silk Road to orient you, to give you a sense of where the Kushan Empire was. And then again, the empire here, and it bridges between Pakistan and India. So again, this is an iconic period. Um, for the Mathura style, we mostly see a red sandstone. We see a very full, fleshy Buddha. We see very broad shoulders and a very thin waist. However, there's a certain softness to the belly, which we've seen before. Um, this is often interpreted as implying control of the breath. In this case, we see two supporting figure attendants on either side. The Buddha is holding up his hand. Uh, in a have no fear gesture. He's in a cross-legged pose. You can see the wheel down below indicating the wheel of his law or the Dharma. You can see the lions again. So similar symbols are being used over and over again. The third eye is indicated. The usnisa or cranial bump is missing. It, it seems to have been um, knocked off. So perhaps it was added separately. You can see that the garments are again quite simple and the Buddha is barefoot. If we zoom in, you can see that expression. It tends to often have a kind of a soft smile. But this is the very traditional style that we see with the Mathura period. So we are seeing the Buddha starting to be very established. The Gandhara style, however, is very different, and I want to think a little bit about the fact that um, Alexander the Great around this time was moving all the way over to the area of Pakistan and India. 
So if we move over to the capital of Gandhara, the capital Gandhara right here, we see a very different style of the Buddha. The Buddha looks very Greco-Roman, so there's a heavy emphasis on drapery, the body is revealed beneath, the body is a little bit more substantial, a little more muscular. muscular. Um, so I just have a quick comparison between a Gandhara Buddha and a Roman emperor here. And then two key works to show you, just comparing a Buddha, uh, a Buddha, <laughs> a Buddha with a Bodhisattva. Uh, you can see the Buddha, again, very simple garment. He would be barefoot. You can see the Usnisa and the halo um, compared to what's called a Bodhisattva Maitreya. So in this tradition known as Mahayana Buddhism or Buddhism of the Greater Vehicle, you see this emphasis on Bodhisattvas and multiple Buddhas, the possibility of, of more Buddhas beyond the historical Buddha. So the Bodhisattva is, some, is an individual who has in, attained enlightenment, who knows the way to nirvana, but has chosen to stay behind to help others reach enlightenment. And Maitreya means a Buddha of the future. And so you can see that this is clearly not a Buddha. The figure is heavily adorned. Um, he has a more elaborate hairstyle. He looks more like a princely figure. So that's an easy way to identify a Bodhisattva versus a Buddha. A Bodhisattva usually looks much more like a princely figure versus a Buddha. Moving on to the Gupta period, the Gupta period uh, is a, an empire that will dominate, again, northern India. Most of what we've been seeing so far is in the north, and we see, again, a very different type of style for the Buddha. So, so far we've seen the Mathura, we've seen the Gandhara style, that Greco-Roman style, and then finally we have this Gupta style as we move slightly later in time. With the Gupta style, we start to see um, much tighter garments and a much thinner style Buddha. So here we see the Buddha preaching his first sermon from Sarnath from the 5th century. It's relatively large, a little over 5 feet, and here we see the Buddha holding a mudra where he's turning the wheel of, of law. So it's a very appropriate mudra, mudra for um, Sarnath because this is where his first sermon took place, that, that location where we were talking about the column of Ashoka with the lions on top. So it would make sense that he's starting to turn his wheel of law. You can see the wheel and followers looking towards it, again in this bottom area here, and then you can see celestial apsaras on either side and a very large halo. Let's go over these basics of the Gupta style. It's very serene, very smooth body. You can see there are some wrinkles around the neck, but otherwise the body is incredibly smooth. The drapery is either imperceptible, apart from some very light hemlines. So you can just see a hemline right here. Um, the face is very full and fleshy. You see these snail shell curls right here, and then this Gupta smile. So just this very gentle smile with bee stung lower lip and bow like upper lip. So there are some very distinct features to notice. So a little game here, I always like to play this. Which style is it as we're going through this early iconic period? You can pause it if you wanna guess. Um, but looking at these figures, you should recognize the gray, more Greco-Roman, the gray stone with the Greco-Roman style. This is the Gandhara, the very tight, smooth bodied figure um, with the snail shell curls. That's the Gupta style. So you can see that tight garment with, again, that kind of very light hemline. And that's the Gupta style, very slender too, we often see with the Gupta style. And then this full fleshier figure, that's the Mathura style. All right, um, also in the Gupta period, we have this wonderful example of cave painting. So the caves at Ajanta are this kind of large uh, horseshoe shaped system of caves. Caves go all the, all the way back to very ancient periods in India. This idea of carving into the living rock was very significant. And we see this for early Buddhist monks. We also see um, rock cut caves in Hinduism as well. So please keep it in mind for both. We're gonna be looking at two different caves, uh, Vihara, so where kind of monks cells, and then we're going to be looking at a chaitya. A ch um, so we look at that in cave 19. So looking at cave 1, the Vihara, you can see it's a large courtyard with these individual cells along the outside. As we go in, you can see it has um, one large sculpture of the Buddha. You can see those snail shell curls again, typical of the Gupta style. However, the body is a bit more substantial here. Obviously going into these caves, it would be incredibly dark. However, there may have been some kind of illumination. Obviously, people could bring lamps with them so that they could see these wonderful paintings. So sculpture tends to survive longer than painting. Um, however, if painting is inside of a cave, it does have a better, a good chance of surviving. However, you can see it is very, very detailed. 
we have some exceptional representations of bodhisattvas which in the, within these caves. So in this particular case, you can see a close-up of a bodhisattva with an incredibly high crown, a necklace, holding onto a lotus flower, which is a Buddhist symbol, this idea of the lotus um, springing forth from the muck of the pond. And you can get a sense of the wonderful colors that would have been used. There were also Jataka tales that were told within these caves, so that's important to know as well. So let's look at the Chaitya Hall. You can see that uh, this one is, a, you can see it's heavily sculpted on the exterior and then as we go in it's more of an axial entrance, so more of a hallway that you're entering into with uh, columns on either side and these Chaityas go again back in history uh, to the early Buddhist period. You can see that there is the representation of a small stupa at the center and then again heavy sculpture decor decoration on either side. But the Vihara and the Chaitya are very important structures in um, this idea of carving into the living rock and creating these types of uh, spaces for worship. And there you could just see an example of the Chaitya Hall. Quickly moving into Southeast Asia, I just wanted to show you how some of these styles were incorporated, especially the stupa, into the area of Indonesia and then also Myanmar. So let's, excuse me, Myanmar. Let's go over to Borobudur in Indonesia. And if we look at Borobudur, you can see that it's a very unusual take on a stupa. Um, you obviously can see that there's a stupa here at the top, and then lots of smaller stupas all along the way, all within the form of a tiered stupa, more or less. Uh, the whole structure is in intended to encourage meditation, the idea that you're moving, through these levels, one level to the next, essentially getting closer and closer, hopefully, to enlightenment, to nirvana. From an aerial perspective, it has a great similarity to, a similarity to um, a mandala, which is a cosmic diagram to aid in meditation. Whether this was intended, it's not necessarily known, but it's a possibility. There's another aerial view to give you a better sense of Barobador. And then you can see there are snakes along the base. I just want to take you up kind of level by level. So you would be moving through areas of light and dark as you go through Barobador. You would also be encountering these kind of hidden Buddhas early on. So there's kind of these glimpses of the Buddha as you move from one level to the next. Um, the Buddhas are, you can see that it has over 1,400 small stupas, 72 perforated stupas at the top, and one closed central stupa. The closed central stupa is empty, so there's this debate whether there was something inside of it originally, but if not, there's this idea of extinction, this idea of reaching enlightenment, of not, you know, not having the need to have a physical presence by the time you've reached enlightenment on this highest level. Uh, there are stories of good work. So, for example, there's a representation of a king, King Opsada, who's distributing alms. So, this idea of gaining merits in life um, to get you to that point of reaching nirvana, of doing good things. So, you can see the king in his uh, pose of royal ease while figures are passing out things to those in need. As we move to the higher level, we reach those perforated stupas, and if you gaze within the perforated stupas, you would actually encounter a Buddha. So you can see these little glimpses inside. And then in, the, in this one, you see the Buddha starting to turn the wheel of law, to set the wheel of law in motion, um, to teach his dharma. And then we have Buddhas facing different directions, doing different mudras. So there's the earth-touching gesture, um, calling the earth to witness, the idea of the earth touching. There's the south where there's a giving gesture, there's a meditative gesture, and then a have no fear gesture. So depending on the direction that the Buddhas are facing. So a very comprehensive monument and a monument that really is intended to assist those in meditation and a real interesting design in terms of how it changes as you're moving from this world of desire and attachment in the lower level to this area of nirvana uh, and greater enlightenment at the top. The last example I wanted to show you is just very quickly um, from Myanmar in Southeast Asia. Um, this wonderful this wonderful construction program from the from the kingdom of Pagan, uh, and so this dates to much later, about a thousand years ago or slightly less. You have this great building period of thousands of temples and stupas. So many people show this in like travel shows. They'll show this area where there are these 
endless number of stupas and temples. Um, about 2,000 of them survive, but I wanted to just quickly show it because obviously you can see how the stupa changes as it enters into Southeast Asia, how the design is slightly modified. We saw that in Borobudur in Indonesia, but also you can see the great variety that existed um, with the Pagan temples in, Maya, in Myanmar. You can see also here just another image. It's often shown with kind of this mist going through it. Um, and also it's been in grave danger due to earthquakes. There have been a number of earthquakes that have damaged these structures. They are predominantly made of brick, but a wonderful overview of the kind of mass construction of these Buddhist monuments um, by the 11th century. So hope that was a good intro, long intro to uh, Buddhism. We'll be moving on to examples from the Silk Road and China in the next video.